All right, so uh, appreciate uh, the, the welcome, Bob. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak. Um, I will say it's great to see uh, such a, a large group of folks here today. Uh, ordinarily, when it, it's announced that uh, a, a nuclear engineer or scientist is going to come and speak, uh, either one of two things typically happens. Either nobody shows up, or the people who do show up are usually asleep after the dessert is served. Um, so I promise it will not be a science or technical discussion today, um, <clears throat> but I do want to share with you just a few things that Bob has mentioned. Um, and I'm going to weave into this a little bit of my own personal testimony, uh, which I think is, is particularly relevant. Um, so um, as you can probably tell from my um, accent or lack of accent, I'm not an original North Carolina native, um, born and raised in New York. Um, grew up in a very, a very loving, um, very strong uh, family in New York. However, didn't uh, necessarily have a very clear understanding of uh, my Christian faith and my Christian walk. Um, we would attend church occasionally, um, but <clears throat> not what I would call a particularly you know, strong or compelling uh, Christian upbringing. Um, <clears throat> but at the age of 14, um, when my family and I went on vacation in, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, for, uh, for spring break, it was uh, Easter of 1978, um, I had, and I, I do believe it's truly God's providence that I was, I was brought there um, um, and was able to attend a, a service. It was actually a college ministry at the time, I didn't realize it, um, that was going around to different locations um, and sharing the gospel message. And, um, and on that Sunday, I, I gave my life to Christ and didn't really understand necessarily what it meant. Uh, didn't really have a clear understanding of <clears throat> what was involved with that decision. Um, after it was over, uh, went, back, went back home with my family and um, was still left with a lot of questions about what this, what this thing called Christianity really meant. Um, I didn't have a lot of uh, guidance or mentoring. I didn't even own a Bible, quite frankly. Um, so I, so I, I was really left with a lot of uncertainty about uh, what, what all was involved with this. But I, I do think that that was really part of God's providential plan as it would unfold <clears throat> as time would go forward. Um, uh, a few years later, um, I, I started uh, undergraduate school in engineering at NC State. Um, then uh, my sophomore year, I met this very nice young lady, and um, we started dating, and she was from a very strong Christian family. And after a, you know, after a couple of dates, she very thoughtfully but politely said that, uh, well, if, it was, if we were going to continue to keep dating, uh, I was going to have to go to church with her. I, I don't know, maybe some of you can relate to that experience, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I reluctantly, somewhat grudgingly, agreed to go. And um, over the next couple of years, uh, while we were still in school as undergraduates, um, I began to hear the gospel message, really for the first time, um, and began to start to understand at least a little bit of what had happened to me a few years earlier, uh, when I was about 14, um, with, with my conversion experience. and. Um, slowly began to start to realize that, <clears throat> that, in fact, the things I was seeing and reading in Scripture and learning and understanding were true, and, I, and, and began to really grab hold of my Christian faith at that point. Um, but in addition to that, or along with that path of <clears throat> Christian faith development, I was also on another path, which was very different, and I didn't realize at the time what was about to happen. But the other path that I was on was as I was studying science and engineering, um, uh, I was on a parallel path with a, a worldview that actually would eventually come to be a significant challenge to my Christian faith. And that's the worldview of scientism, or you may have heard it called scientific naturalism. So when I talk about worldview, it's important to understand what I mean by that term. Um, as most of you here today, I, I, I would say, you know, biblical Christians, you understand the world view of Christianity, whether you realize it or not. You have a world view. You have a way of seeing the world 
through the lens of the gospel and of Christianity. And that worldview shapes the way you see reality. So for example, if we look at some of the events that have happened recently in uh, England, right, the terror attacks the last few weeks, as Christians, we would look at that with our Christian worldview and we would, we would be able to make sense of it by recognizing that, well, yes, there, this, there's sin in the world. The world is lost. We've, we are fallen creatures. We have fallen short of what God has called us to do. There's, there's sin in the world and, and that results in evil, in moral decisions that are against God's nature. And that explains a lot of the, all we think of the evil and um, the suffering we see. That's a worldview perspective. That's how we as Christians make sense of, let's say, suffering and evil. <clears throat> but have you ever thought about somebody who doesn't have that worldview? How they would see the events, let's say, that happened in England? How would somebody who's not a believer in God see those events? Well, there's a couple of ways that they can look at it. Uh, Tom Jasky did a great job a couple of months ago talking about the worldview of relativism. That's a very um, predominant worldview today in our society, particularly in universities and, and colleges, um, which, and I think Tom, as I recall, even showed a video about where they were interviewing college students. And you could see this relativistic worldview that would say, well, you know, there is no truth, and truth is what you, what you make of it. Um, but another very predominant worldview is the worldview of scientism or scientific naturalism. This was the worldview, this was the worldview that I had uh, that was running in parallel with my Christian worldview as I was in graduate school, as I was studying engineering and math and science. And this worldview is also a significant challenge to Christianity and to the Christian worldview. And so I want to take a few minutes and maybe just describe for you some of the characteristics of that worldview and describe for you the things that I struggled with with that worldview and how what seemed to be two parallel paths in my life, Christianity and, science, and a scientific naturalism, actually began to converge at one point. And where they converged, there was pretty significant tension and some issues that I had to work through and resolve. A process that took me a number of years, actually. So the scientific natural worldview, which is held by also by many people in academia and in industry and universities, is a worldview that says that only science and mathematics can determine truth. The only way truth is established is if it can be proven and verified and calculated or observed in a lab. It's a worldview that says that there is nothing outside of the physical material world in which we live. So for example, that worldview would say that there is no supernatural realm. There's nothing outside of the world of nature and that only things in nature exist. Now, this is a worldview that is taught and assumed by many people in the sciences in this day and age. In fact, without even knowing it, I was coming to accept this view as being correct without even recognizing the dangers that it presents and the fact that it is in direct conflict with the view of biblical Christianity, worldview of biblical Christianity. So <clears throat> when this worldview, when I began to realize what this worldview was teaching me, it, it caused me to stop for a moment and really ask some very hard questions. What is the conflict with this worldview and that of biblical Christianity? Well, if you think about what we see in scripture, there are a lot of challenges when you look at um, stories and you look at narratives and um, events and things that take place in scripture that would seem to have a very difficult natural explanation, right? So for example, miracles would be seemingly very hard literal actual miracles would, be, would, would seem to be difficult to explain from a natural standpoint. And in fact, um, several hundred years ago during what was known as the Enlightenment era, when people, when the, when the use of reason and logic began to emerge, this was a very big stumbling block for scientists and philosophers 
because they began to trust reason only as the way to determine truth. And that worldview began to move forward um, into um, skepticism, which would be very skeptical of things that were in biblical or historical writings. Eventually agnosticism, which is a view that, well, we just, we really can't know for sure what the truth is. Which has now really led to where we are today, which is a very strong atheism or material naturalism that says God doesn't exist at all. We don't need God because after all, the natural world is all that exists. And we will just measure and observe what's in the natural world. And that's the sum total of all reality. So now, when you look at the biblical record and you look at what's, what, we, what we see in biblical history, there are some things in there, like I said, miracles, the, the existence of a um, supernatural realm, <clears throat> a realm outside of nature. I'm sure as many of you have experienced in your own life the influence and the teaching and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That, that is something that a physical naturalist would say is just not true because of course we can't measure it, we can't observe it. Right? There's no experiment to perform that we can test it. right? And so this worldview is unfortunately something that is very powerful and very influential with our young people in society today. And one of the reasons for that is that we've all come to know and understand the benefits um, that science has brought to society. Um, everything from medicines to transportation, communications. Science has had a very profound influence on our lives in, in, in many good ways. But scientism, the world view that science is the only way to determine truth, is something very, very different than science itself. And most people, including, including myself for many years, just equated those two things. But in fact, they are very, very different entirely different things. And so as I began to try to understand where this conflict really le resided and why there was such a conflict, I began to study and realize that there are many things that we know to be true in this world for which there is no possible scientific or mathematical explanation. But yet we are all completely rational in accepting these things as being, as being true. So for example, um, events that we see in history are in no way provable or disprovable by the scientific method. The scientific method is used for events that are repeatable and observable, like a chemistry experiment or a physics experiment. But singular one-time events in history, which only happen once, are not testable by any means of science. So for example, can, can anyone scientifically prove that Aristotle once lived in ancient Greece? No. It cannot be proven scientifically. It is a historical fact. In fact, no event in history for which nobody alive today was around can be proven or disproven using the scientific method. This is an important point. Why? Because the Bible contains a tremendous amount of history. There are people and places and events and cultures that are documented in the Bible that have very good historical evidence to support them, but like any other part of history, cannot be proven or disproven using science or math. But yet we're all completely rational in accepting these things as being true. I don't think you'd find anybody today who would deny Aristotle ever lived simply because I can't solve an equation to prove it. So it's extremely important to keep this in mind because there are many people out there today who will say, well, if we can't prove it scientifically, it didn't happen or it didn't exist. Many people. And many of these are folks that are teaching are the next generation of students. But that view is completely false. Simply with the one example I've given. There are also many other examples of things that cannot be proven scientifically, right? That we are all highly rational in accepting. Moral and ethical views cannot be proven or disproven scientifically. There's no chemistry experiment I can perform to demonstrate to you that the Holocaust was, was objectively evil. But yet we all just know that it was, even though we really can't prove it scientifically or mathematically. Value judgments, beauty judgments, 
even reason and logic, even the ability for me to stand here and talk to you today with rational thought is not provable by science. The fact that I'm using words that communicate through a language that you understand is not provable by any means known to science. But yet I think we would all be rationally, we would all be rational to conclude that it is true, that these things do exist. And in fact, the thing that really rung home to me after studying this was, in addition to all these things that I've mentioned, science itself <clears throat> cannot be proven by science. What do I mean by that? The idea that science is the only way to determine truth itself is not a scientifically provable idea. Because it's not a statement of science, it's a statement of philosophy. So if you find somebody who says that they'll only believe things that can be proven by the scientific method, you're well within your right to ask them, well, can that be proven by the scientific method? It cannot, because it's a statement of philosophy. It's a statement of worldview. They're just assuming it's true. They have no way of proving it or disproving it. But yet that is the mentality that we see in today's society. That if it's not scientific or mathematical, it, it's not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. So if you can't realize or if you can't rationalize that, uh, if you can rationalize that there are things in life that we have no scientific explanation for, what would, the, what would the other way of looking at it be? Let's assume God does exist and he did create the universe and everything in it. Do we see characteristics inside the physical universe that reflect a creator, reflect an intelligent designer? Well, actually we do. We, we do a lot. In many cases, we see <clears throat> very organized and structured laws of um, nature. We see structure and order in the smallest of atoms to the largest of galaxies and solar systems. We see intelligence. We see goal-directedness. This, this is not a new observation. Aristotle observed this over 2,000 years ago. He noticed that nature seemed to be working toward a goal, working toward an end, a goal-directedness. These are very self-evident, very obvious facts. So these things seem to point to an intelligence behind the nature and world we see. It's hard to conceive, in my mind anyway, that this is all a product of just random chance. If I were to walk out on Wrightsville Beach today and walk up onto the shore and see somebody right in the sand, you know, John loves Kim, I think we would all immediately recognize that as having come from an intelligent source, not from the laws of nature or from the wind and the rain and the ocean. But yet, inside every cell of our body are in excess of three billion pieces of specific coded genetic information that control every single metabolic function of every cell in your body and my body. Highly precise, highly descriptive, highly exact. And somehow that is just chance and necessity? When we can immediately recognize 12 letters on the beach as coming from an intelligent agent, but three billion pieces of specific information is just happened? It's hard, to, it's hard to get your mind around that when you look at it that way. <clears throat> the universe, the cosmos, scientists are discovering are incredibly delicately balanced. There are constants, physical and mathematical constants, that they have discovered which are precisely in an extremely narrow range, a life-permitting range, such that if any one of these 200 or so constants were to be off by even a tiny amount, life would not exist anywhere in the universe. And in fact, in some cases, the universe wouldn't even exist. Balanced on a razor's edge in incredibly narrow life-permitting and universe-permitting range. Many scientists are starting to come around to this. 
when you look at the cumulative evidence, it certainly gives the impression anyway that there was something going on behind the scenes some 14 billion years ago to orchestrate such precision and such <coughs> detail and such structure and such organized behavior. The fact that the laws of nature are so repeatable and so predictable seems to come from an intelligent agent that would make it that way. And so as I studied these <clears throat> and looked at the evidence as for and against a creator in nature, it, it became rather self-evident pretty quickly that ration and reason, as well as revelation from the Holy Spirit, as I was studying and learning more about Christianity, were overwhelmingly compelling, overwhelmingly compelling, that God does exist, that he did send his, his son to be our, our salvation, to take our place, that we need to be redeemed, that we live in a fallen world. And yes, a world created by God that is organized and specific and precise. But when you look at it holistically, it, it makes the most sense for any explanation that I've been able to see. And so, as I try to close here this, this afternoon, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. What we're seeing today with your children and your grandchildren is a very significant problem in our social culture today. Either the worldview of relativism, as Tom described, or the worldview of scientism, as I've described. These are significant challenges. I have been extremely blessed and fortunate to be able to participate and serve with, with men um, in the Ratio Christi ministry, to be able to help equip students, Christians, to, to address these kind of objections and, and challenges, these questions. Because what, what's happening is, as young students meet this nexus, as I said, of my two worldviews which collided, when students are reaching that point, they are being forced to choose Christianity or science, and it's simply a false choice. It's not a true choice, but many of them are being forced to make that choice, and we're losing a lot of very young, talented Christians because they don't realize that they're being given a false choice. And so part of my goal, part of working with Ratio Christi, is to help students understand that this is a false choice that you don't have to choose between the two. And in fact, it's highly rational that science and God can coexist. Now, the worldview of scientism is clearly false, false on its own definition. But that doesn't mean science is bad or evil or wrong. I love science. That's why I became a scientist, to study the natural world, to see what God had created. Many scientists have come before me who have done just that. Galileo, Newton, Kepler, Pascal, they recognized a designer behind the design and studied the natural world to understand the creator. This is what in theological terms is known as the natural theology, natural revelation. Just by observing nature, we see a creator. Today, many people suppress that truth in lieu of a scientific natural description. But when you look at it very carefully, you realize that that worldview is on its own merits completely false and provably false. And so working with the young students at, at, at the high schools and in the colleges, um, we really hope to be able to help them work through some of the challenges that I faced personally um, in my journey. Um, today, I see a tremendous opportunity ahead of us with young students equipping them to be able to hold firm and hold true to the gospel and its, and its message, but also to be able to engage an incredibly secular and, and even sometimes hostile world that doesn't want to hear the gospel message, that doesn't even want to acknowledge God exists, let alone that Christianity is true. And these are significant challenges, ones that, that I did not have to face and maybe you didn't have to face, because I was able to do this, I was able to go down this path without any external influences. 
But that's not the case with the young folks today. They are bombarded with a worldview of secular humanism, naturalism, relativism, and it's a very big challenge to them. So if you have, and I'll close with this, if you have children or grandchildren that are struggling with this, that feel they're being forced to make this decision, this choice, please come and see us. Come and, come and visit with us at Rashio. Come and, come and see me. We would love to talk to them about this because they're being deceived into thinking that they have to choose between these two things, and they do not have to choose between them. And I don't want them to have to go through what it took me years to go through, particularly with all the other influences that are on them. And so I, I covet your prayers for, for the ministry, uh, for the work that we're doing. And if there's anything we can do to help any students that you have, children, grandchildren, whoever, please come and talk to us. We would love to spend time and talk to them and help them work through this challenge. Um, because if we don't address it now, it's, it's, it's not going to get any better on its own. And I think as Christians, we need to stand up and be able to engage the culture in a very rational, intellectual way, but also in a way that stands on the truth of God's Word.